please open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Paul writes in Galatians 5, verse 1, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. You know, in this country, if we haven't noticed it, we do possess some very precious freedoms. Freedoms that many people in the world do not have. Freedom to choose any career, freedom to marry anyone, freedom to express any idea, live anywhere. Some countries you need permission from the government to move. You can't just live where you want, you need permission. We have so many freedoms in this country. I say this because Paul, in writing to the Galatians here, is writing at a time when the majority of the people that he was speaking to in the first century did not have these kinds of freedoms. You know, some historians tell us that up to 40 or even 50 percent of the Roman population at that time were slaves without any personal rights, without any, without any freedoms whatsoever. But Paul says clearly in Galatians 5, he says they were set free. Now we know that slaves who became Christians in the first century remained slaves afterward. They were slaves and they were baptized into Christ and they were still slaves after that. So what freedom is Paul talking about here in this particular verse? Well the answer is of course the freedom from the principle of law. Paul says that this is the freedom that every person receives and enjoys when they become a Christian. Freedom from the principle of law. Now freedom from the principle of law, this is not a concept that people talk about you know, on Facebook. Last time I looked, people were not, you know, there was no discussion raging about freedom from the principle of law. We don't see this discussed on talk shows, late night talk shows. I've not seen this written about in any editorial, in any newspaper, but this concept is extremely important for every single individual alive. Now, when I say law, I'm talking about God's law, not humans law, uh, human laws concerning right and wrong. When I say principle of law, I mean all that God says that people should or should not do, and that includes the Ten Commandments as well as all the directives and teachings in God's word, the principle of law. Now the problem with this principle of law, which I refer to as just law from here on in, I'm not going to keep repeating that long phrase, we're just going to call it the law from now on. The problem with this law is that when it is revealed through God's word, the Bible, instead of empowering human beings to do good, instead of empowering people to do what is right or to be perfectly in line with God's will, it has completely the opposite effect on people. In Romans chapter seven, Paul describes the three principal effects of the law when it is revealed to an individual. Uh, let's go to Romans uh, chapter seven, shall we? And let's read, uh, um, beginning, in verse, beginning in verse seven. Uh, first of all, Paul says, it awakens sinful desires. So what does the revelation of the law do for an individual? Well, first of all, it awakens sinful desire. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind, for apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. 
So the very first thing that the revelation of the law to an individual does is it awakens sinful desire. Paul says that that knowledge actually produces a greater desire for sin. Sin becomes more desirable once it is seen as forbidden. Exactly the opposite of what we would have thought the law would have done for us. Another thing that the law does when it's revealed to us, it produces guilt. In verse 18 he says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me. How does he know? Well, the law has been revealed to him. And when he looks at the law and then looks at himself, he says, wow, I've just realized there's nothing good that dwells in me, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of good is not. The law reveals my actions. And when your actions are revealed, what is the emotion that you feel? Well, you feel guilt, because you realize, wow, I really am a sinner. And then another thing that the law produces is it produces a sense of hopelessness. Hopelessness, excuse me. Romans 7, 24, same passage. Paul is concluding the passage when he says, wretched man that I am. Notice he doesn't say sad man, he says wretched. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? That sounds like a pretty despairing thing, doesn't it? Knowledge of the law and seeing how helpless we are to keep it produces a sense of either despair or cynicism. You know, we can't fully obey God and this makes us feel hopeless and frightened because of the consequences of this disobedience. And so, when Paul declares to the Galatians that they were free, he meant that as Christians, they were now free from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Well, the curse is it awakens sinful desires. The curse is it produces all kinds of guilt. The curse is it makes an individual feel hopeless and helpless. That's the curse. Christians had to obey human laws. They had to obey laws on taxes and social situations, but they were free from the principle of law established by God. The question is, how? How were they freed? Well, we go to Romans chapter six to take a look at this. In verse 12 to 14, Paul says, therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Remember I said to you in the first century, a third to half the people were slaves, and they remained that way? through social custom and Roman laws. Now in Roman society, a person could gain freedom in a variety of ways. He could be given freedom by his master. Many times the master would adopt the slave as a son. Or you could purchase your freedom with money. Or you could earn your freedom through military service. The gladiators, for example, if they survived the gladiatorial contests, the prize was they received Roman citizenship, they were free. So in the same way, the principle of law keeps men as slaves because when it is revealed to them, they are overcome by the power of sin. You see, as far as the law is concerned, the more you know the law through your conscience or through God's word, the more enslaved you are to sin. Remember Hezekiah in the Old Testament when they found the book of the law and they began reading what the ordinances were and what they should have done, what did they do? They tore their garments and they said, and I'm paraphrasing, man, are we in a lot of trouble here? Because <laughs> they just realized everything they were doing wrong. Now the thing that breaks the power over us and frees us from the curse of the law is the revelation of God's grace towards us in Jesus, in Jesus Christ. You see, when the law is revealed, we are overcome by sin's power and sadness and guilt and fear and hopelessness. But 
when God's grace is revealed to us, we are free from the effect of the law and the power of sin over us. Now in the passage we've just read, Paul is telling the Roman Christians that they're no longer slaves to the power of sin because they are no longer under the rule of law, which made sin desirable, which created guilt, which produced despair and fear. He says, you're not under that law anymore. You're not operating under the curse anymore. He says, you are now under the rule of grace, which makes sin distasteful to us. I don't know about you, but I, I don't like sin. I can remember, you know, I've told you this before, one of the advantages of being converted when you're an adult, you remember what it was like when you were not a Christian, when you didn't have a clue, when you weren't seeking God, where sin, sin is whatever, hey, you know, I do whatever I want to do. And the only thing holding me back is maybe I'll get caught or I don't want to get in trouble, oh, that'll make me feel bad, you know, but. So I remember feeling like that and thinking like that, but I don't feel like that and think like that anymore. Now, I don't want to sin and I'm upset with myself when I do sin. You know what I'm talking about. You tell yourself, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm going to go in and I'm going to speak and I'm going to be calm and cool and collected and then something happens, kaboom, and you blow up. Even after you told yourself you weren't going to do that. And so if you're under the rule of grace, it makes sin distasteful to us. And that grace produces forgiveness and healing in our hearts. And it gives us hope for a joyful future. So Christians are under a new law, a law of grace, not a law of commands. A different ruler administers each of these laws. For example, the law of commands is ruled by a judge. And the law of grace is ruled by a loving Father. So one question that arises from all of this is, well, how does the change take place? In other words, how does God bring us from the law of commands and judgment to the law of grace and forgiveness? Well, there are three basic steps to the process of change. Step number one, the law reveals man's sinfulness and the terrible condition he truly is in because of sin. That's the most painful part. That's one of the reasons why when you begin to have a little bit of a religious discussion with someone, you know, someone who's not a Christian and you kind of somehow, you know, either you've kind of led the conversation to that or somehow you've fallen into a, a discussion about religion and spiritual things, why people are afraid, and you, you say to yourself, why are they afraid? Why won't they talk about it? Because they know intuitively that if they begin talking about religion, they're going to have to face their own sinfulness. How do I know this? Am I some kind of you know, genius shrink or something? No. I know this because that's what Jesus said. The lights come into the world, and what do men do? Well, they don't come to the light, why? They want to stay in the darkness, why? Because they love the darkness. That's, that's a truism, He's not, that's not an anecdote. He's explaining a law, a principle here. Men who are in sin, people who are in sin, they don't want to talk about religion because they know intuitively that sooner or later we're going to be talking about my sin. And I don't want to talk about that because if I have to deal with that, it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. And so the revelation of sin by the law in our hearts is extremely painful. People are guilty of sin. They're helpless to completely resist it. They're condemned to be judged and punished. And so the law is our teacher. It's the light that shines on us to reveal our true condition before God and our need for salvation. I'll tell you something, in our Western society, we're trained not to need anybody. We promote the idea to be self-sufficient, right? Independent, self-sufficient, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know? 
But when it comes to Christianity, it's a complete opposite worldview. You are helpless. You cannot pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can't help yourself. You can't talk your way out of it or spend your way out of it or work your way out of it. You, you can't do that. You're helpless. And so now we're ready for stage two. If you understand what stage one is, stage two, the word of God reveals the good news. You see, the same word that reveals the law also reveals the good news or the gospel message of how God has saved us from the curse of the law. Jesus Christ, God made man, offers His perfect life according to the demands of the law in order to pay for the moral debt that we have accumulated before God through personal sin. All of us have accumulated a moral debt that we have not the currency to pay for. What is required to pay our moral debt is a perfect moral life. And Jesus comes with a perfect moral life, sinless life, and He makes payment for all of our sins. The law says, if you sin, you die. No exceptions. If a perfect sacrifice is offered, then all sins are forgiven. No exceptions. So God sends His Son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the sins of all people according to the terms and conditions of the law. He suffers our punishment so we do not have to suffer that punishment. And then step number three, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the proof to us that the curse of death has been broken once for all. Very simple. You know, I've said this before. Imagine God could have said from heaven, you know what, I think I'm going to forgive you all. I'm just going to send the angels down just to spread the word. You're all forgiven, it's fine, and, and you'll all be resurrected at the end. Just take my word for it. I don't know how motivating that would be. Instead of doing that, He comes in the form of a man, suffers the death that all of us are very familiar with, and then is resurrected. Now I have the proof, now I have the hope, now I have the conviction, now I have the rock solid evidence that I need that this curse of death has finally been done away with. Because I say to myself, if God can do it for him, well then he can do it, he can do it for me. His resurrection is the proof that the debt for sin is paid and that the curse has no effect on Him and on those who become His disciples, of course, through repentance and baptism, when we read about that familiar passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And so the resurrection of Jesus guarantees that ours is possible, and if ours is possible, then there is no longer any fear of death, part of the curse. Remember, the curse of the law is we were afraid. We we're afraid of dying. It's not so much dying, we're afraid of what comes after. The resurrection of Jesus shines forth. Here's what comes after. This is what you've got to look forward to. I don't know about you. I don't know about you. But the thing that God says to me in the middle of the night, three words that I get from the gospel, that I read, when I read the Bible, I don't know how many times I've read it from cover to cover. Three words, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You see this over here, this resurrection? Don't be afraid. A person is under the curse of the law by choosing to disobey it. And that very same person comes under the freedom of grace by choosing to believe and obey Jesus Christ. The law of commands imprisons us, condemns us, punishes us. The law of grace sets us free. You know, I've explained the curse of the law and the freedom of grace in 
kind of doctrinal and ideological terms, but what does this change actually do for me? In other words, what does freedom in Christ or freedom from the law, what does it mean for me in practical everyday terms? Well, freedom in Christ does not mean that we're free to do what we please or free to disobey Christ. You know, Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. Romans uh, chapter six, one and two. You know, he's saying, hey, you, you're under grace, but that doesn't give you the right to disobey God. I'll give you an example. A person is released from jail. He receives a pardon. His sentence is commuted and he is free to leave prison. He receives that pardon and he becomes a, quote, a free man. But does this mean that he can now do as he pleases and disregard all the laws because he's been freed from his punishment? Well, no, of course not. Well, in the very same way, freedom in Christ means that we have a new status with new freedoms and privileges and powers that we didn't have before when we were slaves of the law and imprisoned by the law and its curse. It's something new that's happening to us in our lives. Here are some of the practical things that we enjoy as Christians who are free from the law. First of all, we're free from the power of sin. I've mentioned that before, but it's very important. The knowledge or awareness of the law gives sin its power. In other words, we desire it, we are helpless before it, that's sin's power. It, it's always got a hook in us somehow. It always has some sort of attraction but receiving God's grace. And when we say receiving His grace, I mean receiving the forgiveness that He gives us and the mercy that He shows to us and the promise that He makes and the proof that He gives. All of that and all the spiritual gifts that He promises, all those things compressed down into a single word, grace. When we receive God's grace, it gives us the strength to overcome sin. You see, under the law, no one has the ability to uh, overcome sin, Romans chapter eight, verse seven. Under grace, we receive help to overpower the sin in our lives. For example, we have the assurance that the sacrifice of Christ pays for all of our sins, past sins, present sins, future sins. That's what John is talking about in 1 John chapter 1, verses seven to nine, when he tells us, if you confess your sins, he is faithful to wash us clean from, you know what I'm saying? The blood of Christ washes us clean. Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to Christians. As a Christian under grace, I don't worry about the past, it's all gone. And if I fail today or tomorrow, I have the assurance that I can be forgiven and continue on in hope of heaven. This is not possible under the law. One mistake and it's over under the law. But under grace, the vehicle and the possibility of forgiveness is always open to me each day that I live. Secondly, we also have guidance from the word of God to help us know how to live righteous lives, right? Second Timothy chapter three, verse 16. Every scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? For teaching. Teaching us what? Teaching us how to live, to examine our lives, to prove what is true and accurate in our, in our lives. Life under the law is slavery to rules. Life under grace is a process of sanctification and spiritual development with the cross of Christ assuring us that we will not be condemned for our failures as we grow. So important. If I didn't have the reassurance of God's grace, I wouldn't try to do better. I mean, I, I wouldn't try because I know I wouldn't get very far. But he is like a father that says, don't be afraid. Remember I said that? Don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to step up to higher service. Don't be afraid to do away with that particular sin or that particular relationship or that particular habit. Don't be 
afraid. But God, you know, I, I, I know I'm going to fail at this 50 times before I, I get it, maybe 100 times. And he says back to me, don't be afraid. The cross is always there to reassure me that if I fail in my effort, God will pick me up and will allow me to continue on. So don't be afraid, go ahead, he says, try it. And then God gives us His Holy Spirit at baptism, Acts 2.38 once again, to help us in our prayer life and to strengthen us against temptation, to reassure us when we are weak in the faith. You know, none of these things were available under the law, but are now ours to help break the power of sin over us. I want to tell you something. If you're not with some kind of sin every day, you're not working out your Christian life, okay? I'm just telling you that right now. People always say, well, I'm a sinner, I'm not perfect, I sin every day, and I answer you, well, good, I'm glad you acknowledge that you sin every day, but now tell me this, what are you doing about it? Are you working on that? Are you making an effort at that? Because you know what? That's a big part of your Christian life. Christian life isn't just about coming to public worship services. The nitty gritty everyday grind of Christian life is dealing with the sins in our lives. So aside from freedom from the power of sin, another benefit that we have from being under grace is the following. We have freedom from the certainty of condemnation. The law not only reveals our sins, but it also spells out what the punishment for sin is. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the writer says it is given to man to die once and then comes the, the judgment. That's not a very comforting scripture if you're not in Christ. And then Paul, of course, in Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So according to the law, all are guilty of sin and all will face judgment and punishment. In other words, condemnation is virtually certain for all persons under the law. Nobody will escape. Christians, however, are spared this certain condemnation. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 1, for there is now therefore no, what is it? condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the reason for this is that by virtue of forgiveness and not perfect obedience to the law, Christians are saved from judgment and condemnation. This is how it works. Jesus had no sin because He actually obeyed the law perfectly. Therefore, there was no condemnation of him and consequently no death, he resurrected. We, on the other hand, we have no sin as well, not because we have obeyed perfectly, we have no sin because we have been forgiven. In other words, we have the same thing, but we got it in a different way. Therefore, there will be no condemnation of us and there will be no death we will resurrect for exactly the same reason Jesus did. There will be no sin in us, not because we obeyed perfectly, but because we were forgiven by a perfect Savior. Life under grace as a Christian means that you are freed from the absolute certainty of condemnation and eternal death and assured a merciful and joyful welcome from God at judgment. Do you ever think about that? I remember when Lisa's parents were alive, they lived in a beautiful small little town in Quebec, and her dad had this beautiful old house, it was 100 years old, it was right on the corner of a street, big white house, painted a wraparound gallery, you know, or porch if you call it that, and uh, it had a wreath. And when you went up the steps, the steps and the wreath, the wreath was uh, maybe 10 feet high, so imagine a wreath 10 foot high that goes like this as an entranceway, all decorated with lights and the beautiful snow and everything. And when the kids were small, we'd go there for Christmas and we'd be driving there. And on the way, we would anticipate the welcome that we would receive. You know what I'm talking about. The kids get out of the car and they got their gifts for grandma and grandpa and all the cars are parked there, the aunts, the uncles, the cousins, they've all got there ahead of you because we had to come from Montreal which was 30 odd miles away. 
And we, when we rang the doorbell, ding dong, you know, we opened the door and people were there and the tree was lit and oh, hello Michelle, hello Leo, oh, the grandchildren and everybody was running. Oh, grandpa, so happy to see. In other words, when I'm trying to get across it, you know that welcome that you get at homecoming, at Thanksgiving, at Christmas? That's the homecoming that's waiting for us. We, we tend to think you know, that when we get to heaven, you know, somehow we're going to be like at a social security office. <laughs> All right, what's your name? Where did you live? Where'd you go to church? Oh yeah, did you go Monday? Did you go Sunday night too? Did you? Okay, good. Yeah, well stand over there, we need to talk about it. That's not the welcome that God is preparing for us. You know that welcome that we receive, Lise and our children receive, and I receive from the, the grandparents? Oh, you're here, it's so wonderful, and the ants, oh look at, oh how you've grown, and the kids, oh look how tall you are, Paul, and all that good stuff. That's the kind of welcome that's waiting for us. When we know this, and, I, and, I, and I'm not you know, creating a, a story here, that's the welcome, the rejoicing of the angels, the end of the age, death is gone, no more sin. The knowledge that this is the welcome that is waiting for us frees us from the fear of death and the way that fear of death affects us all throughout our lives. When people are afraid of death, they act selfishly and they are self-centered. They hoard material wealth. They act immorally. They fear growing old. Why? Because they're afraid of death. Why? Because they're afraid of what's going to come after. But we know the welcome that is waiting for us. You know, if there's nothing after death or only judgment after death, you might as well look out for number one while you're here and put off dying for as long as you can. But when people are forgiven for their sins and empowered to overcome temptation, when they know that God will happily welcome them home after they die, they are no longer afraid of physical death because they see it for what it really is. Not the end of life, but the beginning of true life that will never end. You know, at the beginning of this lesson I said that freedom doesn't mean we are free to do what we want but rather we are now free to do what God wants us to do. And here are some of the things that we are free to do. First of all, we're free to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, pleasing to God in righteous living and service to others. I don't have to be afraid that in offering my life in service to someone else that I'm wasting my time, that I've wasted my life, that I could have been doing something better than that. I know that offering my life as a living sacrifice to God is the best use of my life. I know that. We're also free to honor others, to love our brothers, to worship God acceptably, to live in this world as honorable people. We are free to share with others the amazing story of our liberation from sin and death under the law to a life of joy and peace under the law of grace through Jesus Christ. I'm free to do all, I'm free to go all out for God. No holding back, no hedging my bet. That's what I'm free to do. I'm free to be a fool for Christ. I'm free to do that because I know that there is a, a welcome waiting for me and as I grow older in the not too distant future. So I finish this evening with a wonderful story about a nation who was in slavery that found freedom and how they chose to witness their newfound liberty and this is a true story, and I read. On the night of the emancipation of the Jamaican slaves in 1838, a mahogany coffin was made 
and a grave was dug. And into that coffin they crowded all the various relics and remnants of their previous bondage and sorrow. The whips, the torture irons, the branding irons, the coarse frocks and shirts, the great hat, fragments of the treadmill and the handcuffs. They placed all of these objects in the coffin and they screwed down the lid. At the stroke of midnight, the coffin was lowered into its grave and then the whole of that throng, thousands and thousands of former slaves, celebrated their redemption from slavery and their new life of freedom. So I ask you this evening, what is the condition of your soul? Are you really free? Have you thrown off the shackles of sin? Have you broken the cords of condemnation? Have you escaped the dread of death? God calls all those who are under the curse of the law to become free in Jesus Christ. Free from the law, free from sin, free from condemnation and death. If you want this freedom, then come to God believing in Jesus Christ and express your faith in Him through repentance and baptism and you will be free, you will be free indeed, and you will be free forevermore. If this is the freedom that you need, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as Bob leads us in our song of encouragement.